Sure, my name is David Montgomery, and I'm a professor of geomorphology at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. The paper that we just published in Pier J is a preliminary assessment of differences in both uh, soil health or soil quality and nutrient density in crops on regenerative and conventional farms. And a lot of the motivation for the study was that in doing some other research I was working on and working on a new book, um, that'll be called What's Your Food Ate that ought to be out this, this summer. I was looking for studies that actually had looked at trying to test the, the claims that regenerative agriculture actually produced more nutrient dense food. And I couldn't find much in the way of literature that actually had measured both soil in health or quality in terms of soil organic matter or, uh, or microbial activity, and also looked at the nutritional quality of the food that came off of it, or the nutrient nutritional profile, because there's lots of arguments about just what is a nutrient. Um, and I don't wanna really wanna get too down in the weeds of those uh, uh, discussions, but you know whether there are differences in what's in the food uh, grown on these different types of farms. And so we designed with a, a very limited budget, a very preliminary assessment with you know, small sample sizes. So the most important word in the study is preliminary. Um, but it's because we couldn't find studies that had essentially made those comparisons before. So we gathered the data that we could in terms of trying to marshal. Um, it was 10 farms across the US. We ended up with nine comparisons because one of the crop comparisons, one of the crops didn't work out. Um, where we would basically look at uh, measures of soil health, uh, soil organic matter, and the, the Haney index, the soil health index, on uh, paired adjacent farms uh, across the U.S., and then look at the ratios of, of the soil quality, because, you know, soil varies greatly all over a continent like North America. So we weren't comparing real absolute values. The, the key thing was to look at the ratios. We report the absolute values, of course, but the key thing is the ratios. Um, and then also in terms of the nutrition of the, um, the, the nutritional composition in terms of mineral micronutrients, certain certain well, most minerals, certain vitamins and phytochemicals, things like uh, carotenoids, phytosterols and, and polyphenols in, in the crops. And we would look at the ratios between those paired farms where the farmers grew the same crop variety on the same soil type in the same climate in the same year. And it, we looked at the comparison as a way to do it, an initial sort of course screening as to whether there was, you know, um, whether follow up studies in more detail with bigger sample sizes and more statistical power uh, would be warranted to try and actually look at soil health as a way to try and characterize differences in, um, in, in what's in the human food supply. And so we had three sort of different tests, um, each with small sample sizes, but they all point in the same direction that there appears to be you know, real differences between the, the, the foods grown on these different types of farms. Um, but of course, they're preliminary results, and we encourage people to, you know, uh, many more studies to actually go in much more detail with greater replication uh, to actually try and test. That's a big part of what science is all about. And the key word why preliminary is in the title um, is it's a basically a, a quick look um, in advance of what we hope to be much more extensive studies by others to actually assess how generalizable these preliminary results might be. A big question one should ask is, well, what about the full soil profile? And we didn't have data on that. So we're reporting on changes, differences in the topsoil. Now, a lot where a lot of where the root of soil fertility lies in the topsoil, a lot of soil um, biological activity that helps drive nutrient cycling is in the topsoil. So it's a relevant number. But, you know, to extend those to sort of like full carbon accounting for trying to connect to climate issues, you know, it'd be way premature to do that based on this study. Um, but the take home I would offer from it is that it looked like across the board, all the regenerative farms had more carbon in their topsoil than the paired neighboring conventional farms. So the conclusion I'm comfortable taking away, you know, sort of solidly is it looks like regenerative farming can increase the topsoil car soil carbon content. Um, but by how much, you know, and how representative are the farms that we actually um, um, looked at, um, you know, not making claims for universal uh, <laughs> applicability there, of course. Um, but it's a very intriguing result that suggests that there may be a very, that this combination of practices that helps um, build soil health can actually build soil carbon as well. Um, lots more studies would need to be done in more detail with more, more samples across more farms, of course, to draw broad conclusions. But, um, you know, the reason preliminaries is in the title uh, and the conclude and is that the results like you just mentioned, uh, certainly point to very interest, an interesting direction in terms of thinking about farming practices, food. And I think that these preliminary results point uh, in the direction of it being an important one 
that should receive far more attention than we were able to give it in this, you know, this initial look at things. I mean, the, the way that we got into actually doing this study is that my wife, Anne McClay, and I were writing, a, were writing a new book that is coming out in June that's called What Your Food Ate, that looks at this basic question of how does soil health affect the, 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 what gets into our food? How does soil health affect crop health, livestock health, and human health? And there's a lot of dots to connect between those two ends, right? Um, people spend their whole careers studying sort of one individual piece. Uh, so we basically scoured the peer review literature to, and the historical literature to try and look at those questions. Um, and one of the big holes that we found were, you know, the lack of studies that really directly took on and measured both soil health and the nutrient density of, of crops and, and investigated the connections between the two. There's a couple studies out there, um, but there's not much relative to the, the vast sea of agricultural literature. And you know, we reviewed the studies that look at uh, the effects of organic versus conventional farming. Um, and there's a lot of very highly variable results. Again, in those studies, it's typically the phytochemicals are a big difference. Um, and we decided that you know, in terms of um, trying to go with our peer reviewed literature review and a historical review and interviewing farmers, that we'd actually go out and measure these kind of things on a handful of farms and see what we came up with. And that's essentially, you know, the paper that we're discussing is essentially the fruit of that particular effort to do a little bit of probing and testing ourselves in writing this book. Um, what I first heard about Pure J was in reading a paper by Claire Lacan and Jonathan Lundgren on differences in uh, the economics of regenerative versus conventional agriculture on a similar kind of study across corn um, um, uh, farms growing corn in the American Midwest, where they were looking at, you know, what are the expenses uh, that are outlaid on a regenerative or a conventional farm, um, and how did that play out? I think they had 20 or so farms. They had a larger sample size than we did. Perhaps they had a larger budget. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, I read that study and went, wow, you know, this is actually a very creative way to look at um, doing these kinds of comparisons to do sort of paired farms and, and look at the ratios between them. Uh, as a way to compensate for, you know, the horrible mess and noise that there is in terms of the mineral content of soils and different on, on different geologies and um, and so on. Uh, so I'd read a paper there and I thought, oh, well, you know, if we're doing a study that's kind of similar to that um, in terms of its layout, maybe this is a place we ought to submit it. Um, I, I would submit again. I mean, we went through a couple rounds of review and I had to like, you know, completely rewrite the paper a couple times, but that, that's very typical for, for any journal I've ever submitted to. Um, and that's one of the key things, I think, that, you know, the, the, the paper came out much better as a result of peer review than the first version that we submitted, um, probably easier to, easier to read and digest. Um, but, you know, that's a, what's one of the big pluses of peer review is that it helps to get um, things clarified uh, and presented in a way where hopefully our colleagues can actually evaluate it and not read too much into it, but, but not read too little either. Um, and again, I can't stress enough how, how important the word preliminary is in the title of this particular piece of work. But I also think it's important that uh, people publish their data. Um, science sort of moves forward and changes, and even a small amount of data that can open a new direction or new arguments about an, an issue, I think is valuable in, in the long run.